<laughs> speaker is Fred Thabin, who uh, uh, on behalf of the Society of Holland Games co-sponsored this event with the New Amsterdam History Center and uh, she will talk about her book, uh, Land So Fair. Thank you very much, Ken, and I thank the New Amsterdam History Center for inviting me and Len to do this uh, rather interesting topic. <coughs> Uh, my, my novel, Land So Fair, is, is in Hudson Valley in the 18th century and with uh, a lot of flashback into the period of New Netherland, the Dutch period. And my talk is called Creating Fiction Out of Fact, Both in Truths and History. But this Land So Fair is my sixth novel, but my first venture into historical fiction. The recently deceased writer of science fiction, Arthur C. Clarke, once remarked that life was one big banana, allows us to peel open the reality and discover the truth inside. Although Land So Fair is my only venture into historical fiction, I found the process of historical fiction to be similar to Clark's description of science fiction. I had to <coughs> peel of facts and just speak up, but I was told that convinced the reader that the whole revealed is as, as life it happened, that it might have happened, that it probably did happen. I so fair, I sometimes became so convinced as a novelist that something did happen the way I wrote it, that as a historian I lost track of whether it actually had or had not happened that way. I believed my own fancies, I wanted the reader to believe them too. In fact, as I worked on Land So Fair, the words of the Harold Arlen song kept coming back to me. It's only a paper moon sailing over a cardboard sea, but it may be if you believe me. I was beginning then that my goal as a writer of historical fiction was to read or be that what I was writing was how it really was. I thought to do bring the dead past alive into the present by playing with the facts to create a past that existed. I fostered the impression that it did it in just the way I described it. Historical truth in that the novelist makes up facts, makes up a lie with the intent to make the reader believe it's true. Whereas the writer of historical fiction creatively hears and rearranges facts to evoke a version of the past that is hard to tell from the record. As a historical novel, I had a long gestation period. It began in 1983, 20 years ago, the time where I was born, to Japan, New York, and County. It was about to sell pictures. I knew from a few paragraphs in the Central History of Rockland County and from a late 19th century history of the Tapan Reformed Church that went among the first settler Tapan, but that is literally all I knew. At the time, I was in graduate school and procrastinating at the prospect of choosing a dissertation topic. Coming tercentenary had to tantalize me. I decided to put off the evil moment a while longer and go to the New York Public Library to do a little searching in the genealogy and local history division with the intent of writing a short piece about the family for the Rockland County Historical Society. At the library, I discovered a genealogy of the Herring family, typed and bound in 1902, and immediately my eye fell upon the names of my great-grandparents. The names I guess, were the first on the headstone purchased in 1868 in the cemetery plot that my family was still using. Although I had never seen a, a genealogy before, much less I zipped back to generations to discover the name of Jan Peterson Herring, identified as the leader of a group of New Amsterdam families who had banded together to acquire 16,000 acres of land from the Tapan Indians in 1681, my 10 greats grandfather. <clears throat> Still wanting to write a dissertation on any subject I had studied in graduate school, I announced to my family that I was going to take the Master of Philosophy degree and forget the rest of the arduous PhD process. But they urged me to return to the family again, search it more thoroughly for my dissertation. This is the little article that started it. It was published uh, in 1985 by the uh, Historical Society of Rock County. I by the idea I did want to know more about the family, but I was sure that I would not agree to anything so filial, pietistic, and unacademic as to write my family. I was wrong, however. NYU was excited and delighted at the idea and encouraged me to learn the methodology developed in the 1960s and do for New York and New Jersey why historians John Demos, Kenneth Lockridge, Phil Dunn for New England, the history of the demographics and economics of an ordinary early American farm class family over four or five generations. And no one had ever done this for us down here in the so called middle colonies. The methodology involved public records, records, deeds, land surveys, tax, 
court legislative and surrogates re records, including especially books and inventories, also military records, censuses, and what else was grist to know. The Middling family left few journals, diaries, account books, or letters to ass assist the historian who understand it. The public record was all. The result, four years later, is a nearly 500-page dissertation. This is my dissertation. <laughs> Back is both sides of the paper. <laughs> the dissertation published became a book of 300 pages of the Dutch family in the colonies, 1660 to 1800, published by Rutgers University Press. It's happy, except for one thing. Um, although all, th all through the long process of researching and writing the dissertation, it had seemed unfair to me that following the methodology developed in New England for getting at obscure farmers' families, I had to ignore the women of the family, or treat them in a rather cursory manner. I had to pit gender against sentiment and follow the male line in order to reconstruct the family of the academically approved standard. I recalled Abigail Adams admonishing her husband to remember the ladies. I was frustrated. Then I acted. I gathered all my notes on the grandmothers together, ordered them chronologically, and suddenly noticed that they wanted to become a poem. And so I wrote a poem <coughs> called Catch of Grandmothers, a play on the um, name Herring, which means herring in Dutch. It was a catch, quote, fished for and caught in courthouse in the old Dutch church and sometimes sandstone houses in the round hills they farmed up, in the memories of elderly cousins, and if truth be told, when the wrecked knowing it, it was my first foray into historical fiction using conjecture or imagination to round out the documentary record. I put the manuscript in the drawer and forgot it until 1995 when I myself became a grandmother. Then I took it out, found it worthy, polished it, hired a book designer, and had it privately printed for my family on hand paper in an edition of 15 copies. This is the, the version on the handmade paper. Some day later I mentioned this to a friend who asked me the poem and then took it to the Historical Society of Rockland County which did and published a catch of grandmothers in book form in 2004, and this was the, the marketed version. I was now very happy. I had remembered the ladies in earnest, and thousands of readers would remember them too, and in process inevitably recall their own forgotten foremothers and all their nameless sisters, whose joys, labors, and tribulations in centuries of American history have gone unrecognized and unappreciated. But it wasn't over. <clears throat> Michael Shorto, author of the best-selling work about early New York, Island at the Center of the World, suggested I write a novel based on it. I tested it would be too hard, too much work, too disruptive to, to activities as a historian to go back to fiction. I had published five novels before getting my PhD. But the more I did more, was so I so I was so fair. <laughs> yes, I knew it. <laughs> as I had suspected, it was not easy turning a 10 stanza poem into a 360-page novel. It wasn't easy peeling back the facts to make fiction that would convince the reader that it's real truth more than just written. It wasn't easy to learn to show again rather than just tell as a historian could. I set up this talk as a true history because in researching and writing Lenso Fair, I did my already long research in the Herring family into areas I had not previously mined. In doing so, I uncovered a kind of truth, a kind of reality that my original research had not been capable of producing or the academic venture that prevented me from exploring. I found that I could extrapolate facts from the world record and interpolate them into a fiction of that record that told me more, a lot more, about the context of our way times than I had done.